Don't be a scaredy cat. It's Janice Blythe. Ruby from the Hills Have Eyes. And you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. So just tune in and have a spectacular Halloween. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I am welcoming a legend amongst legends in the world of horror and just cult films in general, the legendary, and I do mean legendary, Michael Berryman. I am just so excited to have him on today, it's been a long time coming. Of course, you all know him from The Hills Have Eyes. He's been in so many great movies besides The Hills Have Eyes. Um, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, uh, Weird Science, Cut and Run, Star Trek IV, The Voyage Home. And of course, he did those Motley Crue videos, Smoking in the Boys' Room. And he's right at the beginning of Home Sweet Home. And uh, it's going to be great to have him on the show today. He's a great guy. I've met him at a couple conventions. Uh, he's just a great, inspiring guy, and it's going to be wonderful to uh, talk to him today. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Michael Berryman. Hey, Michael, welcome to the show. How are you today, sir? I'm doing very well. I'm in the middle of the worldwide pandemic. We're staying close at home, and uh, we're going to visit all our friends and friends via... Um, computer and the phone because we don't want them to get sick and die. Yeah, <laughs> none of us want to get sick and die. Uh, this is a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. You're very welcome. Thank you for the kind words. Uh, my pleasure. So, going back in time, I know that uh, you grew up with physical deformities from a rare condition. Uh, you were originally on the trajectory of veterinary work. But while you were working in a shop, George Powell discovered you and casted you in uh, Doc Savage, The Man of Bronze. Um, did you have any acting aspirations before that? No, none at all. As a matter of fact, I left. Uh, I did four years in college, University of California, in San Luis Obispo. I studied veterinary science for two years, but realized that the end of my, the end of my fingers were basically my knuckles. Um, mm-hmm. um, didn't really uh, perform procedures. I learned a lot about um, the field. Um, and I left in 1972, came back to Santa Monica, my hometown. Mm-hmm. Um, was just trying to take any kind of work that was available. Uh, I had a phone call from a friend in Washington State whose house had burned to the ground. And he needed help to, um, to rebuild the house. He was staying in, in a neighbor's house while they were on a two-month vacation. And in the Northwest, you know, it gets the rainy season um, come. So he had uh, a crunch on time, and it's just, his wife was working, and he took the insurance money and bought all the uh, materials he needed to rebuild the two-story log home, which uh, had been destroyed. Mm-hmm. So he gave me a call, and, I, and I've been doing odd jobs just, doing anything. I had no idea what I was going to do for a career. Um, so I did some, you know, yeah, you know, some business, but, you know, the uh, medical issues I had were, you know, when the weather was hot, I can't dissipate body heat, so, mm-hmm. you know, all the various jobs I had during the summer, I had to quit. Um, so I was taking a hiatus, uh, staying at the home I grew up in, and uh, answered the call to my friend, and I said, yeah, I'll come up and help you, uh, you know, stack logs and at least get your uh, house dialed in um, before your friends, you know, come back from their vacation and you don't have a place to live. So I uh, packed up my bags and went to uh, uh, Highway 1, City Coast Highway, and it was uh, 1973. So uh, uh, it was still pretty much safe to... Uh, Hitchhike is still a piece of uh, yeah. he's, uh, um, a great generation we grew up with. I'm very proud of it, actually. Yeah. So I uh, uh, actually went to uh, um, Santa Monica at a bed of speech, and uh, my brother dropped me off. I had my uh, backpack and stuck my thumb out. I got a hitch rides from uh, wonderful people, very friendly uh, 
um, people at uh, mostly BW vans, you know, and um, wound up in Berkeley, California. Uh, a friend of mine is a professor of economics at Berkeley. Huh. And I uh, met him, and then we drove the rest of the way up to Washington State, and seven weeks later we had finished uh, the roof of his two-story log home for my friend. Uh, my my buddy, uh, who was uh, getting his uh, prof- uh, PhD, went back to California. I was going to stay in Washington State. And, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's cool. It's beautiful. Um, mm-hmm. A beautiful part of the world. Um, so I was looking for any kind of work. I needed some transportation. Uh, I was getting ready to uh, buy an old flatbed uh I can catch you two Chevy, one and a half ton flat that I hadn't run in a while. So while I was pouring gas down the car to um, find the uh, carburetor, uh, the owner was in a hurry and he pushed on the floor and was, uh, um, uh, well, they had to engage as a starter. And I told him not to do that until I was clear. Well, <laughs> he did, and uh, Long story short, it backfired and it ignited the small can of gas I had in my hand, which exploded and set my shirt on fire, and I was on fire. Um, wow. Uh, shortly, uh, uh, it took about a minute or so for me to get my shirt off and get through that experience. It was quite excruciating. I had uh, second and third degree burns from my neck up to the top of my head. Wow. Um, but during that time, uh, I, I have no idea what you, uh, your. Uh, um, experiences with the uh, esoteric, but I had an uh, extreme out of body experience, and uh, um, um, uh, the details will be in my autobiography that I'm finishing up. But uh, long story short, I didn't buy the truck. I uh, mm-hmm. went back to my friend's house. I was okay. I had to go to the doctor. I had bandages, and I decided to um, uh, go back to California and regroup. And, um, and then uh, try to eke out some kind of a uh, existence, a way to uh, uh, support myself. Yeah. My friend takes me to the airport. Uh, he gets back from the airport. I, I arrive in LAX. Um, when, um, actually, um, well, the details of coming back home will be on my boat. <laughs> uh, long story short, uh, I had lost a lot of different jobs because of uh, various uh, issues with my uh, um, premature birth and medical, and I had filed for social security disability, um, finally. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the claim was uh, cleared, and uh, uh, the original first payment check for $400 uh, arrived two days after I left Washington. So, had I not had the... uh, situation with the truck, I would have stayed in Washington, I would have received the money there, mm-hmm. and my future would have been different than what it became. Yeah. Uh, my friend called me up and said, um, well, there were no cell phones back in those days, so I yeah. contacted my parents and I called him back and said, hey, I got a check here from you for Social Security, so he mailed it to me and I took that money, a couple hundred bucks, and uh, while I was trying to find work. I went in with a friend who had a gift shop in Venice Beach. Mm-hmm. And you know, we had mostly house plants and then the rest of the, it was a little beach house. It was built in 1930, you know, two blocks from Mission. And uh, along West Washington Boulevard, there were a lot of high-end stores. Uh, across the street was a very famous art gallery and um, antique store and we became friends with our neighbors in business. We didn't stay in business for very long, maybe four or five months max. Mm-hmm. But we um, um, we we did get asked to take some of our house plants and dress up the store across the street because millionaires were coming by in their families and Rolls Royces and dropped up by their chauffeurs to have an antique auction uh, well, a special sale. And we're talking uh, Ming Dynasty, egg urns, and you name it, mm-hmm. high end stuff. Mm-hmm. So we invited some friends to dress up very, uh, you know, in our finest wear while we were, uh, you know, kind of bumping shoulders with uh, millionaires. 
and during the course of the evening, I uh, uh, was introduced to Georgia Powell. Mm -hmm. uh, Georgia Powell had a daughter, and she was one of the owners of the store called the Count Montfrey. Right. And during that meeting, uh, George came up to me and said, uh, pardon me, and uh, I'll describe what I was wearing uh, on one of our uh, 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 friends in business had a... Uh, in an imported clothing store, and one of the items I had purchased was a a black wool with um, white trim and a hood um, from Morocco. It was a, uh, a, a wool cape with a hood. It's kind of cool. Yeah. Anyway, so we were dressed beyond our means, so to speak. And he looked at me and he says, oh, uh, look how you're dressed. Are you an actor? And I said, no, man, I'm not an actor. And he said, uh, well, um, um, actually put his hands up, made the frame with his fingers and down and hands and said, like, looking at my face, said, well, you have an interesting face. And I said, well, uh, that's nice to hear. I've, I've heard that before my whole life, so uh, who might you be? <laughs> he said, well, I'm the, I'm the father of the, one of the owners. My name is George Powell. And I said, uh, Oh my gosh, do you know who you are? You, you, you did War of the World, China Street. Sure, you took the summer of the year. I took that point and tapped my hand and he said, look, you have the look that I need to play uh, the coroner in the movie called Box Savage with you. Know, and uh, um, I, you know, I have a, I'm at one of our studios, so uh, would you be interested? And I said, you know, to myself, I'm thinking, that's the last thing I want to see, you know, more more people to go, oh, look at this funny looking guy, you know, I had yeah. a lot of uh, issues to deal with. And I said, well, uh, what does it pay? He said, well, I'll, you know, write the letter to the screen after school, you'll have a union card, and I'll pay you $400, and I'll pay you dues for the first year. And I said, sure. But he did, and I did, and I um, got a phone call eventually, got a script, and went to one of the brothers, and uh, did a you know, work of, uh, Fitting and uh, got my sides and memorized those and got a phone call to go to uh, the Howard Harold Lloyd Estate where we filmed the uh, scene for Buck Savage and mm -hmm. I did so and uh, I went through a whole day of uh, getting through all those scenes did well and at the end of the day I came home and well, I was actually uh, living on a couch uh, on my friend's couch. Um, and I figured, well, that was a pretty quick new career. And, yeah. uh, um, I was doing odd jobs, and one day I got a phone call, and, uh, it was a casting director. And it was the same casting director whom I had never met, uh, Mike Fenton and Gene Feinberg, they were pretty famous. They were casting for them a movie called Cuckoo's Nest. Yeah. And, uh, they knew about me because, they cast for Doc Savage, but I was cast not by them, but by George Powell, the producer. And they saw, you know, had a made by ten of my of me, and they said, "Well, you like you could be a lobotomy patient." I said, "Well, my father's so over now. No, I'm just brain surgeon. I know three generations of doctors and nurses, and in the state hospitals with my dad taking taking care of patients." And uh, I said, uh, "I'm pretty much." Uh, up to speed on Cooker's Nest, I've read the book, seen the play, uh, who's playing McMurphy, and they say, P.G. Nicholson. And I said, yeah, I'll have a meeting with you. So uh, they gave me a time and a place, and I did, and I met Michael, uh, Michael Douglas, Joel Douglas, Neil Schwarman, uh, Jack Nicholson, and, uh, um, um, Saul Zantz. Saul Zantz. Yeah. yeah. And the rest is history. Wow. Yeah, what, what Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest is one of my favorite movies of all time. Um, I talked to Muse Small earlier this year. Great lady. Um, oh, my great. Yeah, she's still out there working. Uh, I remember when Louise Fletcher uh, won the Academy Award, she said that uh, all the men on this movie made being in a mental institution like being in a mental institution. <laughs> did, did, uh, was, was it like that at all? Well, we filmed the at we filmed the Cougars Nest at the Oregon State Hospital, mm -hmm. which was a real psychiatric hospital, and uh, 
Dr. Speedy uh, in real life was uh, Dean Brooks, who was the uh, executive uh, administrator and decision for the uh, state hospital. We actually had an entire wing to ourselves, which we used to film the film. When we arrived, we we learned a lot. We our production was six days a week, twelve hour days. During the first two weeks, we had rehearsals of major scenes, blocking with camera and lighting. We actually had lighting that was carbon arc lighting, which is a beautiful lighting. It's different. Uh, you have to know what you're doing. You have to time your time your uh, dialogue and performance to the burning carbon rods so they don't flicker at the end of the tank. Otherwise, you have to re restrike the arc and reshoot that scene. So there's a lot of technical detail, but every day of the first two weeks, uh, we all had to spend at least one hour a day for the first uh, two weeks of a six day week with real patients. Mm -hmm. So we learned the ins and outs of what it was really like at that time and place in around 1973 or 4, I think it was, what it was like to be um, uh, a patient in a state, state hospital. Um, we, we spent one-on-one -on -one time with the patients here with their permission, of course. One of the patients was an arsonist and uh, set fire to a church and people perished. He spent the rest of his life in there. Oh. In the criminally insane one, I spent uh, an hour in his room, which is uh, basically a cell. Um, I mean, at least that are not really beaten in there. We you know gang warfare and stuff like in our prison institutions that we have today for profit. Um, yeah. Um, I looked at his artwork while there was an orderly outside the door looking through the window to make sure there was no issues or problems. There were none, but uh, he sh I looked at his artwork. They were mostly charcoal on paper. Uh, the majority of the pictures were of pe uh, drawings of people on fire. Um, so, um, having had a father who was a little bit on brain surgery, we were all just dogs, pretty much, uh, he used to make house calls at state hospitals. So, I was not ignorant of. Um, now in the United States, uh, we don't take care of our fellow brothers and sisters very well. Mm -hmm. If you have mental illness, it's, it's considered to be a detriment, and also you are less human. My father did not believe that was the case. Mm -hmm. I remember one night we went to uh, get in the car, and he said, I need you to uh, come with me. And I said, okay. We're in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. We drove down an alley to a back entrance to a bedroom. He said to me, as he picked up his black leather bag, which he had um, Demerol, et cetera, injectables, the kind of drugs that junkie we love, he made house calls. He was a real doctor. And he told me that that's her window to a bedroom. When I go inside, I will open the curtain so you can see. If I give you a high sign, I expect you to come in through the door. You know, here's a Smith and Weapon. Keep it handy. Her husband is a junkie. He mm -hmm. might attack me to uh, um, steal the meds I have. My father was uh, on a, a Navy surgeon in South Pacific during World War II. Mm -hmm. but he contracted polio, so all, all the muscles from his uh, heart up to his neck were pretty much uh, melted away. He couldn't, uh, he would have a tough time in a hard fight, and he also lost dexterity to be a uh, continue being a neurosurgeon. He continued his studies and became one of the top diagnostic uh, neurologists in the entire planet. Wow. That being said, I was about 14 years old, sitting in the car, watching him do exactly as I described. Calling up 38 Smith and Weston, fully loaded, ready to go in there and not shoot and kill somebody, but to make sure my father was not harmed or, or, or murdered by her husband who was a junkie. I'm just telling you this to explain the fact that uh, I was aware of the real world well, as a very young kid. Yeah. But that being said, here I am doing Cooper's Nest. And uh, 
I remember having conversations with Dean Brooks about uh, the, the state funding, federal funding, matching funds to uh, make sure that these people are not committed crimes. Um, mm-hmm. in state hospitals because they have mental illnesses and deficiencies and how they are treated less than human because that's how society uh, values human life. Mm-hmm. If you're gimped, you're looked at and feared and not appreciated or content considered equal to other people. So the comparison and parallel and observations between Cuckoo's Nest and the reality that I, what I saw as a kid growing up were very much animated uh, during the course of the uh, uh, film in theme and in dialogue. Because there's, uh, there's a scene when Jack Nicholson is trying to express the fact that these other guys in the morgue mm-hmm. says, you know, you know, uh, I think the, uh, Danny DeVito and some of the others were laughing at some of the uh, playing cards that they had, you know, were basically pictures of naked women guys. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, uh, you know, come on, guys, just grow up. You know, it's no big deal. You know, I mean, what, you're you acting all goofy? Uh, hell, you know, you know, different than the average asshole on the street. Yeah. <laughs> That's a huge moment. And it, it, it uh, echoes the sentiment I just expressed. Yeah. There are people that, that need mental health that, that deny the fact that that they're uh, um, in need of uh, some serious uh, intervention and counseling and psychiatric help. I'd say that, uh, that should be something that everyone should have available. I agree. My father died. He put it in his will to make sure that people were not sued for their inability to pay their act bills. Yeah, I agree. So, I know. So that is the uh, and that brings us to something that uh, uh, helps me express and appreciate that which the, the importance of Cook has been expressed, which was to me 128 days of understanding, expanding humanity, and having friends for life, but also getting a career. However, I saw firsthand how. Therefore, therefore, the grace of God to go on. You, you could be, you can be handsome, all muscular, and have a pretty gal, and a great job, and slip on a bar of soap, and all of a sudden wind up deficient. Yeah. So a lot of people t- treat you different uh, the day after that happens. Well, that is a uh, that's a litmus test on what kind of humanity you have around people that you associate with. Mm-hmm. And I'll be very blunt and straightforward, and honest the way we are here right now today. We have a situation where uh, uh, if we don't have World War III or a horrible situation between now and when uh, President Biden becomes uh, in office, I'll be very grateful. Mm-hmm. I'm very honest, straightforward, talking back, and I'll just tell you straight up. Mm-hmm. I appreciate and that. Thousands of American citizens have died because of fill in the blank. If you can't fill in the blank, then you, then you need to educate yourself. COVID. Humanity, compassion, ethics are the cornerstones of uh, my life, period. And if you can't understand those, those uh, qualities or uh, aspire to those levels of uh, interaction with your fellow people, then uh, um, help somebody you can. And that's, that is basically the lesson that came out of Cuckoo's Nest. Wow. So Very proud to have had the honor to be a part of it. It was a spiritual journey for you then. Well, it should be for everyone. Yeah. Uh, when, when you say spiritual, I mean, uh, I, 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 I'm not a big fan of religion. I have, have disdain for religion. I have absolute appreciation of, of, of the spiritual lessons and ethics. Uh, and the humanity I've been taught by so said that. Uh, when I was about 12 years old, I came up with a philosophy of two things. The two things are the two things that cause most pain and suffering in the world. 
It's like in the in the, in the uh, uh, album uh, double album by John Baez called Baptism, mm -hmm. and in one of the uh, um, dialogues he discusses war. Um, around 1964, I was a card carrying member of a group called. Um, Up with people? It, it basically is uh, the largest and oldest and longest uh, anti war um, uh, fellowship of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. Fellowship of reconciliation. These are brilliant people that are global that actually try to encourage people to understand one another as opposed to killing one another. And around 12 years old, I remember seeing a picture from Earth, of Earth from outer space from my uncle who worked for NASA. Mm -hmm. And I saw a beautiful, beautiful planet. Yeah. And on closer observation, I did not see boundaries. I did not see lines, like on a map, between countries, states, and provinces. I saw an Earth. Mm -hmm which I took as a basic foundation to uh, expand upon, which means we're all on this, this is our home. Earth is our mother. All life and creation comes from planet Earth. Uh, you can tell, you know, don't talk religion to me, I don't care about that. <laughs> I care about how we treat one another. So do I. This is how we learn. So what, what I, uh, the, the two postulates that I came up with was number one, Mm -hmm. Most pain and suffering is caused by two things. Number one, mm -hmm. if I tell you my God that I pray to is better than your God, blood leaves people's bodies, people die. Number two, if I draw a line in the dirt and I say don't cross that line, this is my dirt, blood leaves people's bodies, people die. These are very basic concepts which at 12 years old, roughly, I came up with and I realized that a lot of times grown-ups are full of crap. <laughs> Did you... Now, if you want to hurt my family or you want to cause grief or conflict, we're going to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. But when someone tells me that I have to go over there and kill someone's son or daughter, That's not my, good. Con my conversation goes to the following. Really? You're a leader of a country? And you want my, my uh, fellow citizens to go over there and kill? I have a better idea. You, a leader of this country and the country that, uh, that you want to attack, for whatever reason, obviously if you're attacking, you fight back. But I would rather have the leaders in a cage with sticks and bricks and bottles and knives and whatever. And the two leaders of the country is going to a cage. And we sit home, eat popcorn, have a few beers, maybe a wine cooler, and we watch them duke it out. If you can't be grown up enough to uh, work the stuff out, and you can't understand that we're all in this together, and you don't see the common humanity and the value of human life, then I don't need you tell me how to live my life. Mm-hmm. Did you ever expect beyond your wildest dreams that um, the Hills Have Eyes would obtain the cult status that it has? Oh. Well, um, of course not. No, not at all. Yeah, I mean... It's, when, it... I met, uh, I, uh, when I met uh, Peter Locke, Barry Conn, and Wes Craven, I realized that, you know, here's some smart guys and they're told me about the McBean family and, you know, it was a paying job. Uh, I figured, okay, what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting the job because I have uh, had skull surgery and I've got, you know, scars in my head through my skull and my brain surgery and I'm getting hired because of my looks. You know, I hadn't had any speaking lines other than Doc Savage. Didn't have any speaking lines in Cooker. So I had a good close up, actually, had a good emotional moment there for the close up, smile. Um, to me, 
it was a way to pay uh, pay my bills, keep a roof over my head. I was living in the street at the time, mm. in the years. I was in a van and I had a had air conditioning and refrigerator and, uh, you know, I was poor. Yeah. Job. So I said, okay, what do you want me to do? Oh, okay, you want me to play some uh, crazy lunatic mutated killer? You know, we kill for no other reason than we eat people. Big whoop. I'm sorry, but the, uh, the whole concept of uh, hills uh, uh, was just, it was just a job. Mm-hmm. But when we started filming, I, I, I made very good, I made friendships for life, worked for uh, Wes for um, three other projects, and uh, realized that uh, we didn't go all nitty gritty with, uh, you know, gratuitous um, blood and guts. It was actually done um, more cerebral and uh, um, implied violence is always more uh, effective. I started to appreciate his, his art, and we, uh, um, it was a very low budget film. We shot it in Super 16 out in the desert beyond the studio limits, so mm-hmm. a lot of the uh, extra perks were not available. It, it was, uh, it was very challenging. Yeah. And, um, and I went around the country with Wes and Peter and Barry, and we uh, kind of promoted the film. You know, we'd go to Chicago or other kind of other cities, and I would dress up like Pluto and, you know, kind of sit in the audience and, you know, kind of scare people. You know, we were just having fun with it. Wes and none of us had any idea that it would become a classic. But it is, and it just did. Mm hmm, it sure is. It has more of an exploitation yeah. thriller feel to it than a horror film. Well, of course. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I love my industry. I'm happy when I see people working. The remake was, the remake had moments, but, nah, I'm not a huge fan. Me neither. Um, um, it was at Rise Part 2. We had better lighting, bigger budget. Um, some of this, some of the storyline was, uh, yeah, a little weak, but uh, the flashbacks were kind of cool. Yeah. It had its moments. Reaper was a pretty weak character with terrible makeup, and John, God bless him, was doing the best he could, but it was just a seven line little main role. Um, I was pretty happy, and um, uh, I felt pretty confident in the way I portrayed Pluto in the, in the remake. I had a lot of fun with that, but uh, um, when we were promoting Hills, um, before it was released, I had a meeting with Peter Rock, and, and he told me that during the film in the films, I actually had to have surgery under my arms, I had abscesses, uh, issues, mm-hmm. and painful and difficult, and that big, you know, there were big open wounds. But I still did a rough and tumble around the dirt and fighting, jumping, and doing all that stuff, and never complained. But Jimmy Whitworth, who was, uh, like Papa Chu, uh, if we got back to base camp a few minutes later, he would call you and say, hey, uh, we all deserve a bump, which is true, because when you sign a contract, you honor the rules. And, um, you know, the time spent from driving from the desert to your to LA's uh, city studios on limit was time that if you went past your day's hours, that you, you'd get a bump. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry, but Peter and Barry and the producers said uh, they should have not have complained. You know, you agreed, you signed a contract, and you agreed to its uh, policies and procedures. But they moaned and bitched about that, and they were mad because every single time that uh, uh, Jimmy uh, complied with the rules, we didn't get paid much. I think I got $1,100 a week. Yeah. We worked our asses off. And they told me straight to my face. He said, "Well, we're, we're, we're all upset with Jimmy because uh, he caught, he dinged and dent, he dinged us, and just, not just for him. We have to, you know, be equitable. And the union says we have to pay everybody the same. A meal penalty, what, twenty-five bucks here, fifty bucks there. Really? Yeah. You're telling me, and we're working our asses off for you. You're telling me that you're willing to complain about that, but." And so for that reason, you're not going to put him on the poster, but you're going to put me on the poster? Yeah. Well, well 
okay, fine. I still agree with what he said because that was proper and correct. You agreed to it. Yeah. Um, so they said, I'm going to give you a million dollars worth of advertising and put you on the poster. I said, well, uh, thank you. And that kind of helped. Wow. How, how was making the uh, Motley Crue videos? Oh, Motley Crue was wonderful. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. You guys are just straight up Southern California guys. Uh, we had a great time. I had a great time working with the crew. We got along just wonderfully. Um, I, I, I had a phone call from my, uh, my agent, and he said, Hey, kid, I got you a gig. And I, yeah, he's an old school guy. And I go, uh, the term gig sounds funny coming from me, but what am I doing? He says, oh, and it's called Motley Crew. I said, I think it's Motley Crew. I wasn't really aware of it, but I figured, you know, you mispronounced him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll do it. So uh, I had a buddy drive me because, you know, I don't know if the, who the boys are going to be partying with, but, you know, party favor, you party favor. So yeah. um, I was, I was uh, a grown up and I had a designated driver. And, friend that drove me there, we showed up and um, knocked it out of the park. I mean, um, I have respect for the crew, the guys are hard working, they're talented, they, you know, they weren't uh, a bunch of uh, drama queens and uh, busted their ass and we, uh, we didn't really, um, you know, they didn't run off to their trailer and hide, they, uh, they stood on the set and worked a hard, long day and, and we, uh, I, they invited me in. You know, hanging out with them back behind the curtain on the stage and hanging out with them. And, you know, they had, had a couple of barrels full of uh, ice and, you know, some of beer and uh, you know, a whole couple of quarts of uh, Jack Daniels and <laughs> a couple of party papers. But I'm honest, you know, when we parted, we had fun and we worked their asses off and we made a really great video. You know, and I kept in touch with them for, for years. When Nick was having issues with his hand and and ability to play guitar and went through the lab medical procedure and was getting well and give him a call once in a while and check on him. And and then um, we did the Home uh, home Sweet Home video and he called me up for that. And then Vince called me up to uh, uh, be at the opening of his little uh, little, little restaurant in Vegas at the Circus Circus. So I like the uh, the crew. They're they're good guys. um, good people and, and talented and, and just kind of fun. Yeah. A lot of fun. One of my favorite bands. That's probably one of the first things I saw you in, along with um, Weird Science, um, which I'd like to ask you about. Tell me about the Weird Science experience. Well, um, I got in the studio shooting at uh, Warner Brothers Studios in Hollywood, which is where the Weird Science was shot. And, uh, I had not met any of the uh, other actors, or I had not met Kelly or Robert Downey Jr. or Bill no Paxton or Vernon Wells. And uh, uh, John Hughes, I uh, realized right away, he was a genius. He you know, really tapped into the heartbeat of what it's like to be a you know, kid, teenager, etc. Um, I think it was just probably one of the most honest films of that type of genre yeah. that I had experienced in a long time. I, uh, we just had a blast. I mean, John would come up to us and just say, okay, here's the situation. I just, just, just expand on it. Um, you know, um, you guys arrive and you, 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 you know, you're, you're there up and you to be heroes and the eyes of the girls. And, um, you know, it's every, it's every, um, how can I put it? Every, every dork's dream <laughs> to, uh, to be able to, uh, um, you know, get the gal, so to speak, and, you know, and, and not be, uh, have a, uh, uh, um, uh, an icy port on your head and be laughed at, you know, so, you know, from nerd to hero, um, you know, it's classic, classic, it's classic, so, um, uh, we had a, we had a, we, we had a really good time, we had about a week to film our scenes. Um, became very good friends with, you know, Vernon Mills, and, mm-hmm. you know, and I think it was very sweet, and, uh, um, and 
go back and I run the bill at, at conventions over the years. And I remember the last time I saw him before he lost him. I said, uh, you, know, you, you go to a convention and, and you, you have a list of who's there, and sometimes there's just, you know, they, they add on. And I went to see Bill and then see him all a big toothy smile on his. And yeah. I remember telling him that. One of the last conversation, I said, you know, you're my favorite winder. <laughs> he goes, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, aliens. Well, oh, game over, man. <laughs> you know, well, in tr- true lies, hey, get shit. Boom, 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 you know. And Tom Arnold, the same as shooting at him. Um, and he kind of agreed. He goes, yeah, I well, you know, I've got a little bit, you know, that uh, uh, well, great guy, great, wonderful energy, really good, really good guy, really good, good human being. Yeah, that was a sad uh, loss. Yeah. That was a real sad loss. I remember when I met you at Son of Monster Palooza four years ago, you signed my poster. I did lose my teaching job. <laughs> well, yeah, that was a... Um, I remember, but the... That, that line was not scripted. Uh, uh, when we were exiting after the boys, you know, yeah. get the drop on the and take a shotgun away. We have to leave. Uh, John came up to me and, he, and, and we're setting up the camera for the next shot. And he goes, "Hey," uh, he says, oh, "We're going to be on you as you exit, so uh, let's have a conversation about you know these guys are not this type of characters all the time uh, because it's magical. I mean, she, you know, Kelly pulled you guys into this particular world. So, what do you think that their day job was?" And I said, "Well." Um, so we, between the two of us, we came up with the idea that, you know, maybe he was a school teacher, and then, you know, during the course of classes, the kids are being brats, and this is a way for, the, for him to get back at these bratty kids that he has to deal with all the time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, John Hughes and I, and we kind of agreed that, oh, that's kind of funny. So, <laughs> as I, as I leave, it's a moving shot the dolly shot so what that means is if I if you're moving and you have dialogue it's kind of challenging to with more work and time and set up and expense to to uh, uh, set up another shot from a different perspective and get, get your your dialogue line so that's why when I say God bless over my shoulder I knew that from that perspective, where it was toward the end of the day shoot, I, I kind of cleverly figured, well, whatever I say and do in this scene, they're going to leave in. And that's exactly what happened. Of course, he, he, he liked the line a lot, but because I told him later what it meant. Mm-hmm. You know, because we, you know, my character apologizes from a straight up waist up high shot to my face. And then I moved rolling my bike on the last, on the second to last to leave, and I'm pushing the motorcycle, and over my shoulder, before I know he's going to cut, I go, cut this, and then I look forward and continue to push the bike. Yeah. <laughs> well, people may or may not wonder, you know, and say, why would you say that? Yeah. Well, I said that because I knew a gentleman by the name of Red Skelton. <laughs> son Richard Skelton was in my grammar school class. Yeah. And around fifth or sixth grade, Richard Skelton it was coming down with terminal leukemia. And I remember uh, we used to go to the house and my parents would hang out with him and then I would hang out with Richard, the son, who had leukemia in his room at the Skelton's house. And we would read comic books and stuff, hang out. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember when they uh, read the Red would come up in the son's room and hang out with us, sit on the floor with us, cross legged, and read comic books with us. And I remember one day I said, uh, Red, because uh, we watch the show regularly, mm-hmm. I said, uh, Hey, can you do uh, Gertrude and Heathcliff? Please? And he went into us, Gertrude and Heathcliff, the two seagulls. And Richard beamed and smiled, like, You know, I was with my dad, and this is what he's done on TV. And you know, we're rolling on the floor laughing, all three of us. He was, a, he was a wonderful Red Skelton, was a very inspiring, wonderful gentleman. Mm-hmm. And at the end of his live tape, live TV show every week, 
David Ochoa, he would stand in front of the camera and he would say the following. Mm -hmm. I would like to thank our viewing audience for enjoying our entertainment this evening. I want to thank our sponsors. And I'll see you next week. Good night for now. And God bless. Well, it was brought to my attention that the studio executives wouldn't think that saying may God bless was something that was appropriate on, on TV. Yeah. And uh, it was brought to my attention that Red Skelton told the, uh, the studio executives, he said, what is the name of the show? The whole name of the show was The Red Skelton Show. <laughs> and he had no response other than shut up. Yeah. I, always res I always respected that. And uh, Red is a very classy guy. Yeah. So, um, I had a chance to say something when I let go the show, when I was exiting, and I chose to say that as my personal shout out to a fine gentleman. And that's the purpose, and that was the decision, and that was the uh, uh, execution of uh, set thought and. Um, those words for that reason. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's a pretty good anecdote, Michael. Um, how about uh, M Making Cut and Run? I love that movie. Well, I never met this. I did that before I did uh, Barbarian. So then I mm -hmm. got to meet Ruggiero. I didn't understand that uh, he got uh, expelled from Brazil, I believe, from the previous movie where they actually killed some animals for whatever kind of show was recording the scene. I forget how you know me. He dates me at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruggiero, uh, he, his, his uh, production staff and people, uh, uh, they've known him since he was a kid. He had a troubled past as a kid growing up for whatever reason. But he makes, uh, he makes good films. Uh, uh, he's a great cinematographer, he's a good director. But we went down to uh, Caracas, Venezuela, and then we immediately went to uh, Guyana. But while we were in Caracas, we uh, were staying at the Wilton of Maracaibo, it was another fancy hotel. And on the rooftop of the hotel, we were having it was a banquet dinner. There was a lot of people from the government, and we had actors and people from many countries, and then we were getting to be introduced to one another. And during that course of the evening, we met the dinner outside on the rooftop of this fancy hotel under in Caracas in Venezuela. And I'm noticing that the uh, corner, four corners of the rooftop are piles of sandbags. And I've been in ROTC for a couple of years, and I've uh, been around the block. And uh, behind the sandbags were uh, machine guns. You know, it's a guy walking around wearing a white uniform with ribbons on it and stuff. He seemed to be somebody important. And he finally makes his, uh, yeah, he finally comes over and introduces himself to me and says, how are you, blah, blah, blah. And I noticed on his uh, uniform there was a, a name tag and it said Chavez. I didn't know it was Hugo Chavez was, was at the same time, out of the name of General of the National Police. So I told him I said, uh, it's my understanding because I had state prevent marriage signs, so I'm a big believer in that. Uh, Preservation of our rainforest, the lungs of the earth, and having and respect of the natural resources and clean water, for instance. And, mm -hmm. You know, let's not turn our planet into a toilet. Yeah. There are people who think money is more important than that. That's why I like science fiction. That's why I like life journey and future makers. Anyway, I told him. Thank you for your hospitality of your country. He smiled. 
and uh, I said we're uh, going to go down to the, the canopy in the deep rainforest and thank you for you know, mm-hmm. sending your people to make sure our equipment still was left up in the morning. When we come back to work, and uh, thank you for the hospitality. And he said, you're welcome. He said, dinner was lovely. I said, I have a question. He says, what's that? I said, well, um, why are there sandbags in the corners with uh, automatic weapons? They looked me straight in the eye and he said, some people don't like me. And I smiled and nodded. Let it go, and then I said, um, I've been traveling for the last couple of days, and I, I think it would be really nice to laugh. You know any jokes? <laughs> and that's what he told me. Quote, the funniest joke I know is weak, spineless people that make me a multi-billionaire. Actually, instead of people, it's kind of Americans. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I smiled and I said, well, you're absolutely right. Thank you so much. I had a great week. But what he was talking about, if you haven't gotten a clue, he was talking about cocaine. <laughs> yeah. Because... There are people that uh, make sure it shows up in their zip code and plan, whatever. Mm-hmm. And they, uh, they just don't have any self control, do they? But the biggest drug pushers are the pharmaceutical companies. They used to not advertise on television. Mm-hmm. Now, my father was a world famous, he was the top neurologist in the Western Hemisphere of the entire planet. And and I can prove this with the following example. When I answered the front door of my house as a kid in Santa Monica, Mm -hmm. there was a knock on the door. I opened the door. A very tall, big guy wearing a really nice suit. And behind him, parked on the curb, in front of my house, was a Lincoln Continental with two other guys wearing really nice suits. They all had one thing in common. They were deadly serious, and they all had a wire behind their ear. Yeah, I you know it's a secret service. And the first time they uh, knocked on the door, they asked for my father. Mm-hmm. The second time they asked, they knocked on the door, they asked for my father. The third time, same thing. I won't tell you what the third one was because that's in my book. Mm-hmm. But the first time and the second time, that's when. John Kennedy was murdered, and the second time was when Robert Kennedy was murdered, and the third time, you'll have to read my book. Okay. <laughs> Why did they want to take my father for a drive? They wanted to know it was a new way to salvage all the stuff to their brains. Mm-hmm. And then... So, when my father told me that they should never advertise prescription drugs on television because it's hypocritically unethical. I believe the man, you know what, he was right. And I'll tell you why I know it's right. Mm-hmm. So they advertised these, these drugs on TV. And so you know, when they first started doing that, what did they show after that? After that, there would be an advertisement for a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> Did you take those drugs? So if somebody's pushing poison, and then somebody making money, and then somebody else is making money and is splitting with you for taking the poison that they pushed on you. There are other ethical medical ways to be healthy without taking all these drugs. I'm not saying I'm a doctor. I'm not saying don't take them. What I'm saying is, please educate yourself. Yeah, so, wow. That being said, we were in South America making this movie, and um, uh, it was a pretty, pretty strong movie. 
I got to meet somebody who has some big and interest, and that's Richard Lynch. Are you familiar with Richard Lynch? Oh, yes. He was great. What do you know? What do you know? Do you know how he got the scars on his body? I don't know that, but I know his work. Well, Richard was a consummate, uh, professional, extremely powerful, wonderful actor. Mm-hmm. Stage, theater, and uh, film. But he was also a, an immense man with uh, enormous compassion and humanity. He was considered the most handsome man in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And it's about the time when uh, we were, uh, we are the United States and uh, the other countries were in Southeast Asia and were involved in Vietnam. And I'm sorry, but I don't believe it was about communism or socialism. I, I, I know for a fact it was about oil in the Mekong Delta. Uh, money and power, a lot of corruption. Wow. I happen to know the people that evacuated the Saigon Embassy. Mm-hmm. That's another. That's another day in that story. But, okay, re- really quickly, um, tell me about Star Trek IV: The Voyage Home because to me that's the best Star Star Trek sequel ever. Well, it is, but I really quickly want to finish how Richard Lynch became uh, the film. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Michael, I didn't know. Since you don't know. Yeah, go ahead. Richard Lynch went, I believe it was Toronto, Canada. He'd just been, you know, anointed as the most handsome man in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. So, as I said, he had ethics. He didn't think that our country should be in Southeast Asia killing people. He knew it was because of war. So Richard is in Toronto in an open square and, and he takes a can of gasoline with, with reporters and cameras available because he called them. And here's what he did. Mm-hmm. I, Richard Lynch, as an artist and civilian and, and, and fellow human being on planet, would like to offer my body up as my condolences to the poor people of Southeast Asia. Would be mercilessly, mercilessly uh, slaughtered in this conflict, or gas on himself and set himself on fire. Wow. That, yeah. my friend, is an uh, enormous uh, conviction. It sure you is. Say, yeah, mental illness, whatever. I don't care if that's how you perceive it. My point is, he was a man of stature backbone and conviction. He sure was. He took one for the team, yeah. as they say. Well, yeah. Uh, we were very dear friends for a long, long time. So, yeah, Star Trek IV, uh, I think it's, uh, well, I do like the most recent one, but, uh, yeah. you know, but uh, four was one of my favorite. I got to be directed by Leonard. Um, um, the whole concept of uh, the whales and saving the planet, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, it was oh, I don't know, it became very good friends with Major Barrett, Jim's wife, and uh, um, um, you know uh, Jimmy. Um, I I've always been appreciative, very, very much appreciative of uh, everything that uh, Gene had to say because. Between Gene Rod Mary and Rod Serling, I think it covers about everything that's important. Mm-hmm. It's smart television and storytelling, and why the stories are important. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, it was a full production. I got to meet uh, Fred Phillips. When I did Cuckoo's Nest, he did my ears. That was uh, Fred Phillips. He, he um, you know, put together the Makeup Artist Union. He actually designed the series that uh, Leonard wore for Spock. He created the character. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, in, being part of Star Trek was just quite an honor. It was very, very cool. 
As a matter of fact, when uh, they came up with the concept of what the, what the race of aliens were, mm -hmm. uh, I was getting my makeup and uh, Leonard came in and we were discussing, uh, uh, you know, what do we call these guys? And we literally just started throwing words around and we came up with a name. Is, is, wasn't Nimoy a good director? Pardon me? Was, was uh, Leonard Nimoy a good director? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, um, he's, he's certainly... An excellent director. He knew exactly what he was doing. As a matter of fact, well, one day, um, there was a scene in the lagoon, and we were in the studio, stage and somebody at top took a penny and tossed it into the uh, pond he took one look at that and he got on the phone he, he, he called he called out and he said oh, who did that nobody said anything got on the phone called headquarters he says uh, uh, everyone who's doing lighting and gathering they're fired right now i want a new crew asap we're halting production until uh, you give me a new crew. You get your pin drop. The importance of that conversation is the fact that, uh, number one, safety is number one. Right. When you're 50, 60 feet up and you, and you, drop, and you throw something down below into a, a pond just because you're bored or whatever, that could cause, uh, you know, that shows disrespect and also shows a safety issue. Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> I'm, a very big, I'm a very big proponent of safety on the set. And I'll just end that conversation with, uh, I'm, I was a skull cowboy and Brenda Lee. Mm -hmm. uh, because they were pinching pennies, saving money, and safety on the set wasn't that important. It can cause people to be dead. So. Very well said, Michael. So um, do, do you have like a date of when uh, your memoir will be out? I do not yet. I have a website, michaelperryman.com. I also am on Facebook. And mm. I'm in the final rewrite at this moment. I'm ex I'm, I am I'm. don't have a firm date. I'm thinking uh, sometime by the end of the year, I'll be uh, sending the uh, manuscript to my manager. Mm. And she has a publisher uh, out of England. And as soon as we get some kind of a green light, if possible, I'm hoping February or March it can be an announcement. But it's uh, from my uh, birth, and it ends uh, um, right after uh, uh, Cuckoo's Nest. Nice. And after, the, after the release of Cuckoo's Nest. It's not an IMDb, here's what I did as an actor. It's about the story of this young boy and how he lived his life up to the point where things uh, became available. And uh, uh, it's a life journey. It's not... It's not uh, Hollywood's greatest secret suit. You know? Yeah, <laughs> it, 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 it's a real story. Yeah, nice. It's, it's pretty well. It's pretty good. I, I, I read it. It's uh, it's real good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and do you have any um, upcoming movies or anything that got shelved because of COVID? Well, yeah, but there's no sense to mention them because they're dead in the water. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, there's, there's, a, there's a real pandemic going on and um, nobody's working there's no conventions there's no there's no film work it's uh, risky to, just, to even go to the store we're not going anywhere for holidays we'll make phone calls and FaceTime with people because we need some grown ups to uh, uh, wake up and uh, I don't think things will be back to normal for about another year yeah, I think without so. being at, uh, at the risk of being dead. And my heart goes out to uh, every uh, every nurse, doctor, and healthcare worker, and hospital worker, because they're not being respected, and let alone the people that are dying can't even be consoled. I have it all to hands of their loved ones because of this uh, pandemic. You know? Yeah. How people say, people say the pandemic started because of the wet markets in China. Uh, that makes sense. Mm-hmm.
Yeah. You know, um, what, is, what is an education really? You know? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's where you learn. Well, how and what is it that you learn, you know, that which is presented to you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we learn otherwise what uh, really matters. Sometimes, unfortunately, it takes uh, decades to uh, understand the difference. That's yeah. true. That's true. Well, Michael, I thank you so much for coming on today. I'm glad uh, Suze could uh, help out a little bit here. Um, I want you to have a happy Thanksgiving, a Merry Christmas, and please stay safe because we need you. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, same to you and yours. And we, uh, 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 I did fly to a convention in San, San Antonio a few weeks ago, and I was the only person on a plane with a double canister uh, um, respirator and, and goggles. And people were looking at me like, I need to get one of those. Yeah. This is, this is, this is a real deal. And it's about time that uh, people woke the F up and uh, uh, took it seriously for Jays. That'd be kind of nice. It would be, yes. And uh, when your book comes out, maybe you can uh, come back on and talk about it. I would love to uh, be, uh, uh, be very grateful to do so. And uh, um, same to you and yours. Uh, have, a, have a wonderful, safe holidays. And uh, let's hope we can have a conversation soon. And we're all still with it. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Michael Berryman. Oh, he is, he is a national treasure. There's no way to put it into words. Smart man, articulate man, great stories, legend in film. Well, that's all the time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.